was because the Bible said so. And so that is the Bible verse that they specifically used to validate their reasoning for slavery being okay. All right. Um, we'll look at this first question first. So with boxed words or phrases, explain why Douglas uses that specific language. How does each help him um, help his, oh gosh, my spelling is bad, um, help him achieve <laughs> his purpose to illustrate the horrors of slavery. So we'll do this as we read this first paragraph together. I was born in Tuckahoe near Hillsboro and about 12 miles from Easton in Talbot Camp County, Maryland. I have no accurate knowledge of my age, never having seen any authentic record containing it. So I'm just kind of jotting down no records of age. By far the larger part of the slaves know as little of their ages as horses know of theirs, and it is the wish of most masters within my knowledge to keep their slaves thus ignorant. So this is the first time that we're starting to see slaves compared to animals. One of the things that I love about reading Frederick Douglass is you have to think, and we'll see him as he learns how to read, he, as a slave, did not know how to read and write. So he taught himself how to read and write. And when you start looking at, he wrote this, and you look at the language of it, sorry, I'm going to try not to hit you. Um, and when you look at the language of it and just stop and think, okay, this is a man who had to teach himself how to read and write, and he writes better than all of us together, right? You have to be kind of, um, I, I, that's one of the things that I love about reading this is that I keep reminding myself that he had to teach himself how to do this, and he does it so beautifully. Um, so my question is, So my question is, is like, why would they not want them to know their ages, right? So why would slave masters not want their slaves to know what age they were? And I think that goes into, once we find out a little bit more, I think we'll understand that a little bit. I do not remember to have ever met a slave who could tell of his birthday. They seldom come nearer to it than planting time, harvest time, cherry time, spring time, or fall time. So their date of birth, D-O-B, is based on work. A want of information concerning my own was a source of unhappiness to me even during childhood. The white children could tell their ages. I could not tell why I ought to be deprived of the same privilege. So I'm putting that he sees a difference between him and white children. And that was at a young age, right? I was not allowed to make any inquiries of my master concerning it. He deemed all such inquiries on the part of a slave improper and impertinent and evidence of a restless spirit. What does it mean to have like a restless spirit? Like if you, as a slave, what would, what would a restless spirit mean? Useless. Mm. If something is restless, if you're restless, what does that mean? Like you're constantly active. So why would a slave owner not want a slave to be restless? Okay, so restlessness so shows a lack of control by the slave owner, yes.
The nearest estimate I can give makes me now between 27 and 28 years of age. I come to this from hearing my master say sometime during 1835 that I was about 17 years old. So, so he was 27 to 28 years old when he wrote it. My mother was named Harriet Bailey. She was the daughter of Isaac and Betsy Bailey, both colored and quite dark. My mother was of a darker complexion than either my grandmother or grandfather. Okay, so some of the things that we have to realize, you guys, did y'all read um, To Kill a Mockingbird last year? Yeah. So I, I think last year y'all should have read in sophomore English To Kill a Mockingbird. So we're going to hear language in here that is similar, I mean, like you heard in To Kill a Mockingbird, that is um, seen as obviously derogatory now, right? Um, but know that this is coming from the writings of a slave, and it is coming from the writings of somebody who is using language that is appropriate during the time. Does that make sense? Do y'all see where I'm kind of going without going there yet? Yes, no? The N word's gonna come up. Okay. Um, my father was a white man. Uh, I'm going to stop and read. Lines 19 through 30, what is Douglas's tone here as he describes how his family separation, how might this help him persuade his audience of the horrors of slavery? So we're looking for tone. Um, he was admitted to be such by all I ever heard speak of my parentage. The opinion was also whispered that my master was my father. Probably not the best annotation, but it's true. But of the correctness of this opinion, I know nothing. The means of knowing was withheld from me. My mother and I were separated when I was but an infant, before I knew her as my mother. It is a common custom in the part of Maryland from which I ran away to part children from their mothers at a very early age. Frequently, before the child had reached, uh, before. Frequently, before the child has reached its 12th month, its mother is taken from it and hired out on some farm a considerable distance off, and the child is placed under the care of an old woman, too old for field labor. For what this separation is done, I do not know, unless it be to hinder the development of the child's affection towards its mother, and to blunt and destroy the natural affection of the mother for the child. This is the inevitable result. All right, so let's look at this question. For what other reasons would slave owners in both the North and the South separate children from their mothers? So what do we think? He, he gives an example. He gives a reason. Why would, as before they are a year old, why would slave owners separate mother and child? So they don't want them to attach to each other? Okay, so... I mean... So it's going to keep the attachment from happening, right? More so from the child to the mother because, I mean, what are your earliest? Do you remember, like, a year old, like, things that you did when you were a year? No, I mean, not really. To where if you were given to an older woman and as you grew up, you had that person around all the time, you would grow naturally attached to that person, right? If they were affectionate to you. But the mother is different, right? So the mother, it would be harder on them. Okay, so looking at it from that perspective, so it's harder on the mother, right? So looking from that perspective, why would the slave owner separate mother from child? Yes, to keep the affection, but also what? For labor purposes. Okay, yeah. 
And slavery is all about what? Control, Control right? So, I mean, we see the example of the control with the uh, birth date, right? I'm going to control every aspect that I can, even down to your birth date. So if you don't know that, then I'm controlling that knowledge from you, right? Same thing here. If I can take your child away, I am going to control that aspect of you. So every aspect of control, right? Um, all right, so I think we answered that. Line 30. Okay, so what tone do we think we have? In just that paragraph, what tone do you think you have? Is it positive, negative, or neutral? I'd say neutral. Do you feel, do, do you hear or feel a lot of angst and sorrow and worry? in there. So what kind of tone would you say? Hmm. Pull out your phones real quick. I'll let you use them for a minute. Google neutral tone words. And boy, before you start spitting some out, Know the definition of them first. What neutral tone word can we find? What'd you say? Apathetic. And what does apathetic mean? Okay, good. What else? Elusive. What does elusive mean? Implied or inferred, the meaning or abounding in. Mm. Keep going for the next definition. What does candid mean? Um, like caught off guard. Or Read the next definition. Like candid for me is like open and honest. Like they're very blunt. Blunt. Outspoken. Okay. What is it? Authoritative. Okay, so authoritative I think is me. <laughs> Authoritative is, is uh, for me, is a little more aggressive, right? And I don't feel like he's aggressive. Um, callous, I think, is a little bit mean. And I don't think he's mean. I don't think he's authoritative. I think, like, any one of these, like, apathetic, candid, um, elusive for me means, like, um, like, kind of steering away from, like it's kind of un, like unheard of, not understood. So I don't know if elusive works, but I think apathetic or candid works, right? You don't get this sense of happiness or the sense of sorrow. So we're kind of right there in the middle. So I like that apathetic. Um, I've also, one of my favorite is clinical. And when I think of clinical, I think of like a doctor where they're very just kind of forthright. It's kind of like a candid, right? Clinical is like they don't care about emotions. They're going to tell you the truth no matter what, and they're just going to keep a straight face. All right. Um, next, how do you think Douglas's scant experience with his mother shaped his future pursuit of freedom? What does scant mean? Short. Short. Yep. Brief. All right. Here we go. Is everybody with me so far? Thumbs up. Good. You can put your phones away and just kind of put them in your pockets because we'll probably pull them out again. I never saw my mother to know her as much more than four or five times in my life. And each of these times was very short in duration and at night. She was hired by a Mr. Stewart who lived about 12 miles from my house. Okay, so she was 12 miles away. She made her journeys to see me in the night, traveling the whole distance on foot after the performance of her day's work. All right, so 12 miles. On average, how long, to kind of get a sense of this, how long do you think it takes you to, to walk a mile? 15 mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if I'm watching, if I'm watching the treadmill, if I'm on the treadmill and I'm watching a Netflix show, right, I could usually, I, like a decent clip, make, make a mile in 12 to 15 minutes, right? That's like... I'm really into the show, not paying attention to what I'm doing. So 12 to 15 minutes per mile. 
LaRue may be walking much faster. So how long would it take to do 15 miles? How many hours? That's 12 miles. 12 miles, sorry. Maybe you should multiply uh, 12 by 15. Okay. Yes, so do it. Okay, how many hours is that? Two and a half? A little more than two? No. Yeah, a little more than two. Like two hours and 20 minutes. So let's, let's say, let's take, that's a lot of math for English, huh? Let's say two and a half hours. One way to get there, right? Plus the whole way back, plus after a whole day in the fields. So she's probably not moving at the clip I'm moving on the on the treadmill watching a show, right? Or or what are you saying? I'm slow. No, she's asking. <laughs> or she is faster than me. Yeah, I mean, like after that whole day, right? So first of all, that's dedication. Right? So you could feel like the, how much that mother is missing their child to do that after that long time. Okay. She made her journeys to see me uh, in the night, traveling the whole distance on foot after the performance of her day's work. She was a field hand, and a whipping is the penalty of not being in the field at sunrise, unless a slave has special permission from his or her master to the contrary. A permission which they seldom get, and one that gives to them, gives to him that gives it the proud name of being a kind master. Okay, so notice he uses this dash a lot. And what you see on, like, on the other side of the dash most of the time is, like, kind of what I would call, like, a side conversation. And usually it's, like, it's um, extra important information about whatever he's talking about. Can y'all read my writing up there? Is that better than like a black pen, like a regular pen pen? Yeah. Okay. Um, so notice the permission from his or her master to the contrary. Permission which they seldom get. Who's the they here? Slave. The slaves. And one that gives to him, that gives it. Who's the him? The master. The master. The proud name of being a kind master. So only kind masters. So now we're talking about types of masters, which kind of sounds crazy to say that there were, there were kind slave owners, right? But he's saying that there were slave owners that said, yes, of course you can go and, and be like an hour late to work in the morning to go walk 15 miles to see your kid and walk 15 miles back, okay? I do not recollect of ever seeing my mother by the light of day. She was with me in the night. She would lie down with me and get me to sleep, but before long, but long before I waked, she was gone. Very little communication ever took place between us. Death soon ended what little we could have while she lived, and with it her hardships and suffering. She died when I was about seven years old on one of my master's farms near Lee's Mill. Say what? Well, because it, he eventually was on that farm. Yeah. I was not allowed to be present during her illness at her death or burial. So notice there's this list again, right? So like these, all these important, like all these important events, he couldn't go to. She was gone long before I knew anything about it, never having enjoyed to any considerable extent her soothing presence, her tender, tender and watchful care. I received the tidings of her death with much the same emotions I should have probably felt at the death of a stranger. So. What were his feelings about, like, so when did he find out about his mother's death? Did he find out immediately? So he found out, and whenever, I'm just going to abbreviate him as FD. So he found out much later about his mom's death. And he compares it to what?
So did the purpose of what the slave owners were doing in the beginning by doing the separation, did it work? So the slave owners were successful in their control. Okay, so when we're reading this next section, look at this next part that we're looking for. In your own opinion, what would a slave owner who had slave children have to tell himself to justify such abhorrent behavior? So Frederick Douglass's slave owner, right, had relations with his mother and now this child is running along his farm his baby with his wife the slave owner's wife there yes with me okay called us suddenly away she left me without the slightest intimidation um intimation of who my father was this is his mother the whisper that my my master was my father may or may not be true and true or false it is of but little consequence to my purpose whilst the fact remains in all its glaring odiousness that slave holders have ordained and by law established that the children of slave women shall in all cases follow the condition of their mothers okay let's stop what are a couple words in there that we may not understand? Odiousness. Okay. Okay. Somebody look up odiousness and somebody look up ordained. Okay. Laura, were you looking up ordained? Oh. And ordained usually has to do with like a like religion. What was the second one? Officially what? Uh, the second one was order or decree. The first one was make someone a priest or a minister. So it, it's the idea of it being officially ordered, but the idea of being ordained is like ordained from God, right? So slaveholders have ordained, like they have been officially ordered, and by law established that the children of slave women shall in all cases follow the condition of their mothers. What does that mean? Because if they follow the condition of their fathers, then they would be free. free. And this is done too obviously to administer administer to their own lusts and make a gratification of their wicked desires profitable as well as pleasurable. So why is it that slave masters, they get two benefits out of having relations with a slave woman? What benefits do they get? Pleasure and another body to work on the farm for free that they didn't have to pay for. Usually, sometimes, though, they also trade with other slave tr owners who had relations with slave women, right? Um, yes, they cared, but you have to remember during this time, the women were, like, subservient to the men, right? Um... For by this cunning arrangement, the slaveholder, in cases not a few, which means many 
sustains to his slaves the double relation of master and father. Uh, I know of such cases, and it is worthy of remark that such slaves invariably suffer greater hardships and have more to contend with than others. Which slaves are we talking about here? Mm -hmm. Why do you think their life would be harder? Well, one, they have lighter colored skin, right? So amongst their group of people, they're already going to stand out, right? And then they are also seen as being um, uh, sometimes that, that they're special, right? And treated differently than the other slaves. So then that makes them stand out as well. Um, they are in the first place a constant offense to their mistress which is the wife, right? She is ever disposed to find fault with them. They can seldom do anything to please her. She is never better pleased than when she sees them under the lash, especially when she suspects her husband of showing to his mulatto children favors, which he withholds from his black slaves. So mulatto is like mixed, my daughter. Um, the master is frequently compelled to sell this class of his slaves out of deference to the feelings of his white wife. Somebody look up deference. David, will you look up deference real quick? D-E-F-E-R-E-N-C-E. Mm -hmm. -E -E. That'd be like deferred, right? Mm. Deferred? D-E-F-E-R, yeah. It's just a D -E -F -E -R? yeah. Feelings of his white wife. Yeah, I was going to say out of respect would be like my. Yeah, I would say respect. The master is frequently compelled to sell his class, to sell this class of slaves out of deference to the feelings of his white wife. And cruel as the deed may strike anyone to be, for a man to sell his own children to human fleshmongers. It is often the dictate of humanity for him to do so. So society says he must. For unless he does this, he must not only whip them himself, but must stand by and see one white son tie up his brother of but few shades darker complexion than himself and ply the gory lash to his naked back. And if he lisp one word of disapproval, it is set down to his parental partiality and only make a bad matter worse, both for himself and the slave whom he would protect and defend. So do you see like where the problem is? So now if he keeps the slave, if he has any heart, he's going to have to treat him the same as other slaves. So when he whips, he's going to have to whip the slaves. And when he whips his own son, right, that's brutal. And then if he has other kids, those kids take over and they have to whip slaves. And so the, the, the envy and anger from not only the wife, but from the siblings that they would have, right? So really it was, it was kinder to sell the, the child than to keep the child on the plantation. Um, in your own opinion, what would a slave owner who had slave children have to tell himself to justify such abhorrent behavior? So what would we say? If you were a slave owner, what would you have to tell yourself in order to have that approved? That it is the law. That what is the law? Okay. Is that what behavior is it referring to? Um, I, I think all of the behavior. I think the behavior of sleeping <laughs> with the slave woman, right? The 
whipping of their own son or the selling of their own son. I think all of that behavior, you have to justify it to yourself morally, right? So what else would you have to tell yourself? What did we say? I mean, that it's, it's the better thing to do to sell, right? It's, it's, the, it, it's better. I mean, I think that you would have to tell yourself that it's better than if they're sold rather than being on your own plantation. And, yeah, I mean, a lot of times I would say they didn't even care. I mean, I would say that if, if you're in that, even though there were good slave owners, I would say that your sense of morality is a little skewed, right? Um, all right, so now we're looking to explain how Douglas uh, logically refutes, and refute means to go against, right? The argument that slavery is justified by the biblical story of humanity. So every year brings with it multitudes of this class of slaves. This class of slaves is the what? But which which one is that? Yeah, the the. Uh, the slaves born of slave owners. It was doubtless in consequence of a knowledge of this fact that one great statesman of the South predicted the downfall of slavery by the inevitable laws of population. What does that mean? So every year, more of this slave class right? This class of slaves being born from slave owners increased, increased, increased. One statesman said that there, there has to be an eventual downfall of slavery because of the laws of population. What does that mean? They can't keep they what? They, can't keep. they can, they're going to keep having children with slaves, but then what does that mean? There'll be more population of those types of slaves, which will eventually stand up against slavery, which will end slavery. That's asking a lot, right? Whether this prophecy is ever fulfilled or not, it is nevertheless plain that a very different looking class of people are springing up at the South and are now held in slavery from those originally bought for, brought from this country from Africa. And if their increase do no other good, it will do away the force of the argument that God cursed Ham and therefore American slavery is right. Hmm. So the argument says God cursed Ham, right? According to the Bible, Ham offended his father Noah. As a result, Noah cursed Ham, son of Canaan. It was a common belief that Africans were the descendants of Canaan, and because of Noah's curse, could be spiritually enslaved. So now, what does Douglas say? Because of this new mix of people who are currently enslaved, they do not fall. They do not fall under the Africans that were descendants of Canaan because they were descendants of white men, right? So Frederick Douglass says the biblical argument's stupid because if Africans are the descendants of Canaan and they're supposed to be enslaved, who are these slaves that are born of white men? Should they be free? Does that make sense? If the lineal descendants of Ham are alone to be scripturally enslaved, it is certain that slavery at the South must soon be unscriptural, meaning that it does not follow the Bible. For thousands are ushered into the world annually who look who, like myself, owe their existence to white fathers, and those fathers are most frequently their own masters. So his logical argument is because the mulatto slaves 
are born from white men, they are not African descendants is it C A N A A N Do you all understand that? Do you understand why logically that that makes sense? 